In 1798, the Federalist, remember Washington warned very clearly in his four-year-old address, have no parties. Have no parties. He goes, does it sound like a great idea? What's going to happen, you're going to be leaving the main source. You're going to be further away from the main source. The main source is what? The Constitution. And who is true keepers? We the people. So in 98, actually it was very interesting, his federal address was written by him and Madison. He did a 180 and came back to that. But he warned very clearly. So in 1798, the Federalist, John Adams, his wife got upset because a, a writer actually said he had a fat behind and was a little upset at that. The Alien Sedition Acts of 1798. Please, please read those understand that. The Kentucky Revolution was written by Jefferson, the Virginia by Madison. And in the Kentucky Resolution, Resolve 1, he actually says the phrase of nullification. In the Virginia Resolution, he act, uh, Jim Madison said the word actually the phrase of interposition and we're duty bound to resist. Now it's important to understand this because 1798 and 1800, when we get to 1833, you're going to get guys today from the Heritage Foundation, from the North Carolina Institute of Constitutional Law saying that he did not mean that. Well, I actually happen to read those papers and I'll go through what they, what they articulate. And Dr. Woods and Dr. Go uh, Goodsman, their bibliography is beautiful in this stuff. So, the others, okay, because the, the question had to be asked is what do you do when the federal government usurps their power? And we already have the, the First Amendment. They are, so what they did was Jefferson said, here's what they got to do. The first thing is you have the, first, the, you have the, the separation of powers, Constitution, they overran those. You have the Bill of Rights, you have the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights, they overran those. So what do you do? And this was it. Now, every state, but, can, but North Carolina said you, you're wacky on this stuff. It doesn't work, it doesn't work. North Carolina did not support it, but they didn't go against it. But those same northern states that said no to nullification during that time, because they were federals in the North, actually used it for the next 50 years in their benefit. And for those people who say that slavery goes back to nullification, does not know their history. First off is, in the War of 1812, the North was upset at Jimmy's War. They, they wanted to have communion with their brothers in, in England. They did not want to war them, have war with them. So they had the New Haven, the New Haven Convention, that was started by Governor Morris. And who was he? He actually penned the Constitution. And he's going to have a nullification co conference to actually secede the New England states. But the war ended, everything went fine. You also had uh, bankers in Ohio, not like in the Second Bank of the United States, actually using the power of nullification to nullify the Bank of the United States in Ohio. You actually had, this is the big case, is you had a man named Joshua Glover who was a slave. In 1850, the Fugitive Act said a black man is property and the North must return him to their state. He got to Wisconsin. Wisconsin Supreme Court said, we nullify that. In 1859, the Supreme Court, uh, Alpsum Boots case, actually ridiculed Wisconsin. Wisconsin thumbed the nose to him. They said, come and get him. He didn't leave him. So it was used to help the slave man. Now, everybody goes after Calhoun. Calhoun, with the abomination of terrorists of 1820 to 1832, used an nullification act. And he was wanted South Carolina's view of that act to be paramount to all the rest of the country. And that's what Madison was against. He wasn't against the idea that they cannot nullify it. It was that in the specific act to actually nullify the whole constitutionality to every other state. So that's where Madison goes. And Madison says, Jefferson never used the word nullification in one of his letters to his friend named Edmondson. Then he's given a draft of Thomas Jefferson's handwriting and apologized for that. Then he walks through the idea of saying, okay, but if you do have to get the nullification, understand, let's go through the steps first. The first step is the checks and balances built within the Constitution itself. If that doesn't, and, and the dualism of federalism with the, the, the states and the, gov and the uh, general governments. If that didn't work, the ballot box, which in 1800 got rid of the Alien Citizen Act. If that didn't work, then you have the actual go back to the text of the Constitution itself. If that didn't work, then you have the state legislators in a position between the individual and the Leviathan. That was where he talked about. A, a Dr. Fitch from, uh, from the Heritage Foundation, a professor of law in New Mexico, in his paper in February this year stated that Nullification is there, and it is there, but all you do is basically complain. There's no actual legal action of that. But that goes back to what Diana talked about at the beginning today is, who are the legal parties to this contract? The states. 
where they get their actual power, the sovereign the individual. So that's why it's crucial that we understand our history. Because remember, knowledge will ever govern ignorance. And we're going to be free, we must understand that. So now, when you look at the history of that, I want to read a quote here from a collective's thought. This is a collectivist. And uh, I'm going to read two of these because this is important. The majority has at all times a right to govern the minority and to bind the latter to obedience to the will of the former. In a general sense, the will of the majority and of the people is absolute and sovereign, limited only by its means and power to make its will effective. It sounds a little weird. So the majority over-supersedes the minority. Who is that? Joseph Story, 1833, Supreme Court Justice, who was a Marshall protege. He's the one that's quoted all, a lot by big government people today. Now, how does that correspond to this? The unity of the nation's spirit and will are worth far more than the freedom of an, indiv of an individual. And that the higher the interest involved in the life of the whole must always have the duties over the interest of the individual. Sounds like the same thing. Adolf Hitler. Understand, there's a national government. So that's why our founders wanted an individual government. I think about when we talk about private property again. Private property is the core, the core of who we are as a country. Madison, uh, um, Washington also quoted, thou shalt not steal is very easy with private property. And John Adams said, if you take private property away, by definition that's tyranny. Rousseau, the French Revolution, was private property is the core. He said, the first person that called himself private property is not the bad guy. It was those people who actually believed that. See the difference? The French Revolution led to, led to guillotines. Ours led to freedom. So now we're at this core right now. Now, what are we going to do today? Today. Well, people go back to the Supremacy Clause saying that that supersedes everything. All right. We'll go back to Hamilton again. In New York, New York actually did not vote. They left. Hamilton came back towards the end of the convention. They never actually voted for the Constitution at that convention. They did not, not have a quorum of their own guys. So when he went to New York, he had to argue with the Senator, uh, Governor George Clinton on actually what it meant. He says, here it goes. The Acts of the United States will be absolutely obligatory to, as to all the proper objects and powers of the general government. The laws of Congress are restricted to a certain sphere, and when they depart from the sphere, they are no longer supreme or binding. Again, the father of big government. We even get to our other guys who saw this. Another supremacy clause guy. The Constitution, as to the powers therein granted, is constantly to be the supreme law of the land. Every power ceded must be executed without contradict or the laws of the Constitution or the individual states. But gentlemen should distinguish that this is not the supreme law and exercise of powers not granted. It cannot be supreme in cases that are not consistent with powers specifically granted to it or, or it's usurped it, the powers. Another great guy, William Davy, North Carolina. I know I get very fast here and passionate about this, but it frustrates me to be lied to over and over and over again. So we have a conclusion we could do to this. How do we fix Obamacare is just a fulcrum. Again, I think NDA is even worse. When we could have the president, we have the president, his discretion, suspend habeas corpus, assassinate somebody at his will. We have two men run for office, one who's done it, and one says, trust me, I won't use it. We have this Agenda 21, I know that catchphrase, but please look at it detailed. When you hear people talk about light rail and dense population zones, that's Agenda 21. Obamacare, again, is attacking our life. So how can we do this? Let's go back to Madison's plan. Let's go back to the very first thing. The very first thing is let the a debate occur and let our checks and balances work. Well, okay, here's the checks. If the, leg if the legislative branch at the federal level pass an unconstitutional act, what happens? Well, the first barrier is the executive. He doesn't sign it. Oops. How about if he writes it? What's the next step? Supreme Court. Supreme Court, I'll read, I'll read it in a quote in a second, is not supreme all decisions, but they have a part taken to see what their opinion on that. They can't enforce their opinion. What did they say? Oops, they made a tax. They made a plunder. They made it now a jail sentence if you don't pay. So they were set their bounds. So what's massive the next step? Ballot box. Okay, ballot box. Well, a lot of people saying they wanted to now, they wanted to repeal it by executive order, which is unconstitutional. 
Now they want to replace it. So they want to replace an unconstitutional act with another unconstitutional act. Oops. Next one. Go back to the words of the Constitution. That's where we're at now. And this is the part that I really feel, let me use a Gandhi quote. In this fight, I really feel this way right now. First, they ignore us. Second, they ridicule us. Third, they fight us. Fourth, we win. We're between the second and third now. So the Supremacy Clause. All I hear about is that the Supremacy Clause is, uh, is superior to everything. Well, I'm going to read two guys here. And then I'm done with reading quotes. <laughs> to consider the judges as the ultimate arbitrators of all constitutional questions is a very dangerous doctrine indeed, and of which you would place as under a depotism of an oligarchy. Our judges are as honest as other men and not so more. They have with others the same passions for party, for power, for privilege, for court, for, court, for their body. And their power is more dangerous as they are in office for life and not responsible, as other functions are to the elective control. The Constitution has erected no such tribunal, knowing that to whenever hands confined with the corruption of time and party, its members would become despots. Thomas Jefferson. I'm going to read this last sentence of this guy. Above all means insisting that the Supreme Court is our servant, is, is our servant and not our master. The Supreme Court is not the highest authority in the land of constitutional law. We are. That's from the radical, crazy founder, Dean Kramer, 2004, Stanford Law School. So when you look at it objectively, we have to understand something. This battle is over our life, our liberty, and our property. So, right now, Article 1, Section 7, Clause 1, the House representatives defund this bill tomorrow. The question is, why haven't they? Number two, an executive order is constitutional if it actually does things within the executive branch. The sad part is the last two presidents, over four times the law, are coming out of the executive than <coughs> the legislative branch. So now we go back to the position we're here today for the nullification. Nullification is where our state legislators tell the federal government they've usurped their power. I hope I read enough quotes here from our founders and North Carolina, North Carolina founders and men who signed that contract on what it meant. Because the Supremacy Clause in Article 6 of the Constitution says the Constitution is supreme law of the land in pursuant of those things that are in the Constitution. And they are enumerated. Article 1, Section 8. Find me health care. Find me Social Security. Find me illegal wars. Find me 30,000 drones. Find me a light bulb. Find me how much water in your toilet. That's the frustrating part, that we have state legislators who know this and are acting. Again, I get back to my premise right now. Elections are now, every two years, to fight over what they're going to divide our plunder. So let's get back to something that's really important here. Are we going to be ignorant as Jefferson wore not to? No. Are we not going to be knowledgeable as Madison wore not to? No. But the question that we have to answer ourselves, we have the passion, the passion of the red line of Virginia, where he said, you know, peace and tranquility and liberty at the cost of chains. He said, forgive all God, Almighty God, no, not for me, but give me liberty or give me death. That's the passion we have to have. And for those of you who are believers, as I am, what do I have to fear, heaven? So this is, we have to have that kind of passion here. And we cannot sit around anymore and say, it's okay, they know more. It's okay, it's just, they, it's, just, it's just a party thing. No. Men and women died, sacrificed everything for us to have an opportunity to live. We've got to be that city in the hill. Be the example. The example is you build a republic that people will drive to and want to become, not crush them into democracy around the world or at home. I thank you.